Hi, this is Damon Pistolka, host of The Faces of Business, where I talk with interesting people sharing life and business experiences to entertain, engage, build community, and provide information to help others succeed. If you're interested in learning more about one of our guests or how we are helping business owners generate wealth and build businesses they can sell or succeed at Exit Your Way, you can find more information on our website, ExitYourWay.com, or by contacting me directly, Damon, at ExitYourWay.com. I hope you enjoy the show. All right, everyone. Welcome once again to the Faces of Business. I'm your host, Damon Pasalka, and I am excited today because with me, I've got Margo Waldi. Welcome, Margo. I'm going to switch this around here, too. There we go. Definitely. Damon, thank you so much for having me. I'm super happy to be here, and I'm not usually a guest on other people's shows. So I know. It's a little bit different. It's fun. It's fun because we get to switch it around. So uh, I was fortunate enough to be on your show last week. I think it was. Yeah, yeah. last week. And it Cargo was a lot of fun. Margo. Yeah, Cargo Margo. So if people don't know, we're gonna today we're going to be talking about increasing supply chain profitability. Crazy times for people that, have, that are in anything that has to do with shipping anything, which is all, which I don't know anything that doesn't get shipped. And I think I've used anything at least 10 times already in these sentences, but it it just affects everyone. It affects everyone. And so I'm really excited to have you here today, Margo, to to tell us a little bit about your background and kind of how you got into what you got. Because you've been in you've been in logistics and moving stuff around for most of your career, correct? Yeah. You know, it was interesting after I graduated University of San Francisco. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I had majored in business corporate communications and I knew I liked people communicating with people, but I wasn't really sure what direction I wanted to move into Conway freight. I don't know if anyone remembers Conway freight, but this was about, okay, cool. 16 years ago, they had a business development program. And so I entered into that program, basically learned the ins and outs of the industry, transportation, And through that business development training, you could shadow other operations, uh, Mm -hmm. teams, you could shadow the sales teams, pricing, and then basically, you know, coupled with your strengths and passions, decide, you know, where you wanted to go. And that's really how I started in the industry. Wow, that's cool. That's cool. Because, I mean, when you look back, when you started, it was at the, the, you know, the kind of the forefront of the Amazon I mean, really, we didn't even, because that was a couple of years ago. We'll just say it's a couple of years ago. Not a ton of years ago, but it was a couple. But I had, the re- I had to deal with the recession, and that was really mm-hmm. interesting. So when I first started selling, I mean, things, I, I feel like you could close business anywhere. Yeah. You know, people were shipping. Things were just, they were going great. Mm-hmm. And then about two years into it, you saw right. all the changes that were happening. People were getting laid off. Businesses were closing. I never similar, that. Yeah. yeah, and similar to kind of what we're going through, you know, uh, post pandemic, mm-hmm. a lot of changes, a lot of supply chain uh, being shaken up. Yeah. And so people had to get creative. People were wearing different hats at the time, just like now. Yeah. Um, and so it was similar, you know, you go out and you buy your dollar pizza at your favorite place or taco Tuesday. Even those of us that have bought furniture lately, we're all feeling it. Oh yeah. And and these dislocations are coming from the I believe the pandemic. Yeah. Oh, there Let's just start to uncover this a little bit because I think it's cool to have someone that's right at the front line of the industry like yourself in here because and you glossed over this a little bit. So I I'm going to look at your LinkedIn profile a, a bit here and we're going to we're going to talk some because in your experience you're not really given it justice. So <laughs> you, you you were at XBO Logistics for a while. You're at Old Dominion. You you're at now Dependable Supply Chain Services, and you've been at Dart Entities for four years. I mean, you you've been in this for a while. You lived it. You've had to sell into it, like you said. Through now, you went through the recession in in 08. Now you're back into COVID through it, coming out of it. 
and with dark entities, it's got to be super exciting because what we did when you started the e-commerce and the whole shipping it right away, you know, individual item right away, you know, everything before was big quantities going to the box stores and people taking it from there and maybe some e-commerce, but now in the last 15 years, that's, you know, we, we, how many box stores are dying and for every box store that dies, how many individual shipments does that mean that we're doing? And, you know, so go ahead. Absolutely. Go ahead. Absolutely. And you, you hit the nail on the head when you, you mentioned JIT just in time. Yeah. And that's really that Amazon effect that you touched on. All of us yeah. need something right now where we're not willing yeah. to wait. We're not yeah. willing to drive uh, five miles, find a parking spot and mull through a store. We want it right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So how much, how much of what you see and what you deal with anymore is bulk freight truckloads moving or more of a combination of you know i might move bulk freight into a facility but then i want to drop ship to individual uh individuals out of those that what's comparatively and kind of the changes that you've seen in that no definitely i think that when you're looking at how someone is utilizing modes of transportation and what modes of transportation they're utilizing that really depends on a couple of things. There's so many layers. So for instance, geographically, where are they located? Where are their manufacturing plants located? And most importantly, where are their customers located? Mm -hmm. And with transportation, you know, some of the major supply chain issues, if you will, are related to transportation. So whether it's making sure you're controlling your transportation costs, your utilizing the correct modalities to get your freight to whether it be your next DC or to a store. Yep. Super important capacity. Are you using assets? Are you using brokers or maybe a mix of those? And I don't think that there's necessarily one right way. I think that the most important aspect of it is to really analyze your processes and how they come together, you know, transportation, fulfillment, the end user it's really like a puzzle and you want those pieces to fit uh, otherwise you're going to get that disruption in your supply chain and your customers ultimately feel that pain mm -hmm. yeah we talk about modality it's funny that you said that because i live in in seattle and we're right near the 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 north south train uh, the rail line's not far from our house because we live in north of Seattle and Edmonds. And we were noticing a train going by last night or the night before. And it was, you know, completely full of containers. And then the the semi-trailers that are on the rail cars going is, and it made me think about all the different ways that freight is moving around us and our products are moving around us every single day. Do you think that this has gotten more complex over the years or there's systems and ways to handle it has gotten easier for for manufacturers and distributors and retailers? I think it's easier based on the technology that we have today and the support and knowledge based on all these previous experiences. Uh -huh. The thing is, is that you need to partner with whether it be a consultant, an asset-based company, or even someone that's involved in brokerage that has the knowledge base and the experience to help you strategize when you're looking at moving freight, importing freight, working with a warehousing fulfillment center, it, it's really important to have someone that's knowledgeable and has that experience. And then, of course, coupled with your knowledge of your business, the scope of work that you're looking to outsource and your product, because mm -hmm. you're the one that knows all of the special intricacies of your product and your customer. And really, you know, here at Dart, for example, we put on our customer's uniform and we're working through their scope of work, whatever that might be. Um, you know, we definitely look back and we analyze those processes and help them streamline them so that um, they're saving money overall, but I definitely think it really depends on your end consumer and the product and where you're located. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, because that is uh, the the thing that's interesting to me when you look at some of the um, some of our clients and and their suppliers and, and the things that are happening is the the importance of having you know if you're a decent size e commerce supplier now and you're on the west coast and you don't have an east coast present presence it really hurts you because you can't get product to your customers fast enough or multiple facilities, you know, to be able to get uh, around the United States to get, get uh, product customers. So do you see that uh, companies are trying to do that multi distribution centers just to get closer to the customers? Yeah, you'll see a mix. So you see store layouts geographically, you'll see store layouts and DC layouts, so distribution centers. Yeah. And depending on whether or not Dart Entities is feeding one of their DCs or feeding the store, so the end user, it really varies. But again, I go back to you want to look and control your costs. You also want to have that support of capacity with your asset base providers and again, it's really looking geographically at how you can service your customers within that next day point. Because like I mentioned, and you mentioned earlier, it's that Amazon Prime shipping, we want it now. So really, I think looking at what you have going on geographically, analyzing the scope of work at each of those locations while managing transportation, I mean, this is this is a lot, uh, you, you know, you can really save a lot of money. But again, I'm going to go back to the transportation, control, controlling the costs, making sure yeah. you have that capacity in that service. Yeah, that's that's cool because it, it is. And as you were talking about it, I was just thinking about the way the business models have changed for stores. Right. Because for me, we have Nordstrom's close to us. And not that I go there very much. If anyone sees I dress, it's not that I dress great. But uh, the the thing is, is that I know that their store sizes have been reduced over the years because a lot more of their product is come in and see it in the store, but we'll ship it to you at home. They have some of each size, but they don't have the big stacks of the inventory like they used to because they ship it from their distribution centers. And do you find that your customers at Dart are using that at some places where I might have a store that's actually or, or a customer base that's really close and we keep lower amounts of inventory in stores and direct ship, maybe bigger items or, you know, because if I'm selling washing machines or something like that, I don't even have 27 pairs of the same washing machine in, in a store. I could have three and then my distribution center could actually even ship those out if people would rather do that. Do you think, do you see those kind of different scenarios happening? Yeah, they are happening, Damon. And also just, I mean, one real simple reason why is space constraints. Yes. Industrial property is at a peak right now, people are fighting for that capacity. And so, like you said, these smaller store footprints can't hold that extra inventory like a fulfillment center can. Yeah. 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 Because this is, it's got to be interesting for you to be able to dive in with some of these customers and really get your team looking at the way that they do things and being able to come up with innovative solutions for this. Absolutely. And it's solutions that have to work with their uh, company, their culture, their values and their mm -hmm. products. Right. And so to be able to do that can be quite difficult. But once it happens, it's just fabulous as far as how the supply chain can really work for you and getting that product quick out to your customers. There has been businesses that have failed because they cannot get their supply chain right. Oh, yeah. And that's it's a bummer. And I'm sure, you know, you're in manufacturing and you, you see it. Yes. Yes. And, and we've had some e-commerce clients that their supply chain is their ultimate weakness. And when that's the case, you really, you really have to, it's a tough time running the business successfully just because you, you have to get that in place because your product has to be there when your customers want it. And if it's not, they're just going someplace else. Well, and that's exactly what, regardless of, you know, any opinions on Elon Musk and Tesla, but, you know, he looked at vertical integration and that's yep. really taking control of your supply chain. And that's why he didn't have as many of these disruptions as other people had. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a great point. And that, and, and it did, it did prove, prove out well for them. So what are some of the, you know, we've, we've heard a lot of talk about, okay, supply chain, container costs, you know, all that stuff's gone through the, through the roof. And, and now the fuel surcharges, I don't even want to think about what they're going to do or are doing. Um, in fact, I need to write that down because there's a couple of things that I need to look at on that because uh, I'm sure that's going to increase some some things that I need to consider with compliance. But it's uh, what are some of the underlying things that that you see that are challenges coming up that people may not be really aware of? You know, for me, I think it all really starts internally. When I think about some of our partners, potential partners, people that I've worked with and for procurement, planning, forecasting, those are things that come to mind first. Yep. If you have an idea of what is going to be on the water, what is on the water, and you can plan receiving, put away and picking things could be so much more successful, streamlined, transparent. Uh, but I would say that is one of the areas where a lot of people struggle is just in that forecasting, um, in that planning, planning phase. Yeah. And you, you hit three points that I think people, they, they could, they're really good if I'm buying something, making sure I have that, that container or that truckload coming. But when you have a hundred truckloads coming, you look at receiving, put away, and then picking for those orders. That's where a lot of times they fall down, at least in the people well, that we work with. And when you can forecast properly, then your partners are able to forecast properly to support that business coming in, right? So um, labor management. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And and that's, that's what's happening right now. Um, with a lot of these supply chain issues is labor management. So if we could forecast and get all of that mm -hmm. labor in line, things would run really smooth. Well, and two, then you're not, you're, you're leveling your labor labor needs out. You're not using too much overtime. You're reducing your cost to, to do those functions. If you can keep it steadier. Yeah. yeah. And at the same time, you're managing your customers expectations. Right. And I think the other thing about that is, is managing quality and inventory accuracy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's another yep. big one that comes up. Yep. You know, it, yep. you, you think it's pretty easy taking note of what you have. I mean, Damon, I could ask you what you have in your pantry and fridge right now. And I, I'm sure you feel confident that you would know, but there's going to be some items in there that you forgot um, or some items that you thought were in there. So I think that, yeah. you know, inventory accuracy is so big and plays such a huge part in the supply chain. Yes, that is that is something that uh, it is funny you said pantry because Jeff Lem, somebody uh, that he's in Canada does warehouse stuff. He's uh, not I shouldn't just say warehouse stuff. That's a drastic understatement. He's he's written a book on warehousing and developed some nice courses on it and and things. And he 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 looks at it, his book is called I've got it lying here. It's so funny because you said something about your pantry. Your warehouse is not your fridge. Oh, I love that. Is that <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that yeah. is so cool. Jeff Lem, L-E-M. But uh, and so it, when you say your pantry, you're right. It's not like that. Your warehouse, you have to, the, the, the receiving, the put away, what inventory goes where and why and, and all that stuff to, to help uh, along with the planning. Because yeah. it, as you see in the companies and you see a lot in, in Dart there, I'm sure is, you're you're in fulfillment to the customer when you're not talking about truckload quantities. It's much different, and the planning is or that is much more. Um, it's more critical. It's just the picking of orders and the and the the shipping of the individual orders. If you're going to ship thousands of orders a day, you got to get really good at picking and shipping orders. Well, and think about how many times you've ordered something and you open the box and there's extra items that you didn't order or there's mm -hmm. items missing. Oh, yeah. And yep. the time, the time and the money that it takes to return, right? Yes. To return an item. Yes. Yes, that's for sure. That's for sure. So accuracy of the, of the actual fulfillment 
is huge. Yeah. And yeah. I think technology. So we have yard management systems. We have warehouse management systems. We have transportation management systems. These are really important. Yes. Really important. And one of the issues that I hear often is we have these systems in place, but to extract data that we can actually use to make proper changes to level up our supply chain, that's that can be difficult. So I'm not going to give any re recommendations on systems, but I think it's yeah. important to look into these systems, uh, make sure that your supply chain tech stack is current and you have support in that arena. Well, and, and how many years has it been since you said those words for the first time, your supply chain tech stack? Did people even think about that 15 years ago? Probably, you know, it was probably not nearly as much as today if they did. And, and yeah. but it's critical, as you said. And the other thing that you said, I think is, is, is super important is if you can't make meaningful changes with the data, it's worthless to you. And you, you hit it. You said you don't have data to drive the right changes or you can't get the data out to drive the right changes. And that's when you're looking at those systems, it is important to do that. And as you, as you said, from the beginning, your, your planning and forecasting is key to, to really being the most efficient, having the most efficient supply chain you can have. Definitely. I mean, when you're looking at some of our clients, they're bringing us in a couple hundred containers a week. And yes. so a yard management system is super important when you need to find one container out of the 300 that you have in your yard. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. And Go I ahead. think that, well, yeah. And the data, it also helps us manage that labor. Like I mentioned, it, it helps you uh, support you in holding your teams accountable as well. So there's different layers to mm -hmm. having a solid tech stack. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Can you think about the things about, like you said, I've got a couple hundred containers out there. I've got, I've got, and that's sitting outside of my distribution center here. And I've got multiple distribution centers around the United States with the same hundreds of containers outside there from lots of different customers trying to do this. And I've got in that same inventory inside and I'm going out with individually fulfilled orders or truckloads of, of product. That's a heck of a job. Yeah. And especially too, I mean, think about it. I was on a call earlier and we were talking about the different uh, manufacturing plants they have and what they're feeding into their current DC DCs. So that's interesting as well. So when you have to marry up product and it's oh, going yeah. into another DC, uh, you know, it's not just moving from point A to point B. There are a lot of things that happen in between then and timing is everything. So that's why when I said uh, transportation management, your vendor relationships, your carrier supplier relationships, those are super important. Yes. Yeah. And if you're a big manufacturer and I've got one plant that makes one, one piece of an, another assembly in it, you know, if I don't make the whole thing in one facility, that adds a ton more complexity because you've got on the road stock, you've got stock in the yard, you've got stock, in, maybe a little stock in the manufacturing facility to use it and, and some stock in the facility where you're producing it. And that could be multiple facilities feeding into multiple facilities that then feed into distribution centers. Yeah. And it, and it really depends on, again, the scope of work and the commodity too. So uh, you're looking at, let's say a heavy commodity where you have to use rail. And so you're looking at that intermodal piece, that rail piece to go into the DCs, but then you're going to convert it to truck. So yeah. there's so many restrictions to think about too, as oh, far man. as your products. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. This is, this is awesome to get to get to just think about some of the stuff that, that you guys are doing there at Dart and the, the challenges that you get to solve. So what are, let's, let's go to that. Let's go to that. What are some of the, some of the most, interesting challenges that you you've been able to solve in the last couple of years so one of the the first one that comes to mind is kind of what i mentioned earlier is looking at the commodities coming out of manufacturing plants and getting them to a dc and one of these was a manufacturing plant that was also doing cold and dry goods 
And so to combine the cold and dry and get it to the DC in time, uh, and then out from that DC that we're feeding out to their stores. Uh, wow. And so we didn't do any of the transportation, but we did a lot of the labor behind that. And so that was really interesting as well, because when you're looking at cold frozen storage versus dry goods, uh, it's completely different. It's a completely different scope of work in our world, right? Because mm -hmm. the people that are handling the materials, uh, their experience is different. Uh, the equipment that they're utilizing is different. Uh, so uh, you have all of that into that mix. And so like I said, that's why you want to really go with a provider um, that has the experience with your commodity and that scope of work that you're looking to fulfill. Yes. That's an awesome example because it, the complexity, like you said, alone, that alone, if you're moving the frozen, you certainly don't want it to thaw. And, and uh, the dry goods, you probably don't necessarily need them to be frozen. And there's just a lot of things to, to consider in that. Wow. Well, and I think that with the team too, so labor, right? We want to make all of our, our teammates feel special and welcomed and really be able to fulfill what is it their passion in the industry. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, only certain people want to work in a frozen cold environment, mm -hmm. just like there's only certain people that want to work in the dry environment or yes. certain people that are okay to lump trailers uh, throughout the day. You know, when we open up that container, you never know what you're going to get. Yes. Uh, so there's a lot of moving parts in that sense. And so you really want to make your team feel valued and, you know, really special because they are, and they're yes. working very hard on these different scopes. So that's another yeah. thing to think about. It's just, a, I always go back to the labor aspect. Oh, no, no, no doubt. That is, that is fundamental because if, if people haven't seen what it takes in terms of things coming off of a container and, and the whole warehousing process and fulfillment process to get it to you, uh, they should appreciate the people that put in a lot of work to get it there. Oh, it's yeah. something, something. So you, you talked a little bit about passion. So what, I mean, you definitely like logistics. So you are, you were in, in the Los Angeles area there. So we talked about, you had, you had a few dogs. So that's, that's correct. Yeah. That's uh, like fun. So what kind of dogs do you have? So I have three dogs. I have a German shepherd, a Bichon poodle and a chihuahua. And then I oh. also have two bunnies. Neverland dwarf bunnies and one California desert tortoise. It's a circus. No doubt. This is when you just <laughs> studied the dogs because it's like German Shepherd and then the Bouchon and then the Chihuahua. And then you said the bunnies and then the turtle. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah, You're busy. It's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. No, I, and I want a horse. I know I'm nuts. So yeah. hopefully in about five years, I'll have my horse in the backyard. I hope my husband's not watching. He's going to be like, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So the, uh, yeah. Cause that keeps you busy. It does. And the three girls, they keep me on my toes. Yeah. I have my daughter turned nine yesterday. Oh, awesome. And yeah. Happy birthday, Maxwell. And then I have a seven-year-old and the, I still call her my baby. She turns two on the 30th. She was my pandemic wow. baby. <laughs> wow. Awesome. Awesome. You, you are in for the time of your life. <laughs> You're scaring I, me. <laughs> no, no. It's awesome. It's awesome. I, 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 I absolutely cherish the time I had raising kids. My kids are in their 20s and the late 20s now, I'm in low, young and late 20s. And, and I'm going to tell you, you are in for some of the most incredible times in your life. Your kids, when they when they start to do things like band or they decide they want to be in choir or play some sports or whatever the heck it is they want to do, just reading books, playing chess, it doesn't matter. It's just so much fun. And you're right. You're right. I love the girls are into horseback riding and I love watching them. It's amazing. I just, Damon, I'm nervous about high school. You should be, you should be, you should be. That's all I'll tell you. Cause, cause, it, cause it, when, when we went through it and our daughter's 27 now, and it is, it is, as they say, they come full circle. It's like, it's like, you know, I still remember, and I told somebody this yesterday, it, it broke my heart when my son quit holding my hand walking across the street. I can remember when he was 12 and he said, 
dad, you don't need to hold my hand anymore. And I'm like, oh, oh, okay. But oh, your daughter, no. the whole high school thing, and, and you, get, you get to that teenage years, they kind of, they go off on their own. But then when you, when it's like in their early twenties, it kind of starts, they're in college and they get to this later years in college or that age in the 20, 20s, 22, 23, they start to think about mom and dad might not be so dumb. <laughs> so you made, you made it from, we're a complete idiot to now we're like, not so dumb. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's progress. It's progress. Right. And, absolutely. Uh, and it's, it's great though. It's great though. When they get a little bit older now, my da daughter, I think when she turned 24, 25, it was like, it was, it's just fun. We have fun now and it's, it's a lot different, but you, you are in a very special time and I've, I've got friends with, with, you know, with kids that are similar ages and I just, it's, it's so much fun. I'm just so happy for you to have, have that Thanks, opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> they are cute little nightmares. They are, it is, I was telling someone they're expecting and I said, it's the best stage. They're the cutest, but it's not going to get better until they're about four or five. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's good. Awesome. Dude. Awesome. So let's get back to just a little bit more about supply chain, because cool. I always like to let, let people learn a little bit more about the people that I'm talking to. And that was awesome. And yeah, I'm just happy for you. <laughs> I just I'm, I'm <laughs> giggling and laughing about that for the rest of the day. The uh, So when we look at the supply chain challenges coming, coming to people now, what are some of the things that you go that you just say, this is the biggest thing that's going to hit us in the next 12 months other than fuel costs. Everybody sees that, but that's, you know, labor. Yeah. Labor. We need to plan for labor. We need to be understanding in regards to the environment that we're currently in uh, right now. Everyone is fighting for the same people. Yeah. Yeah. And, do you and it's easy. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, well, and it's and it's easy. So for providers to flex up 25 percent, you know, I, I mentioned forecasting, um, getting accurate forecasts. But it's really difficult when you tell a provider that, you know, we're bringing X amount of containers in and then it's, you know, 50 percent higher than what oh, was yeah. planned. And, and we see that. We definitely see that. I mean, it goes it's the same on the other end. But um, so I think just having that understanding that right now labor um, is tight and we have great partnerships and we have the labor ready. Uh, but if we could get that accurate forecasting to plan labor, oh, things would be perfect. Yeah, you're right. Because it, you know, the flexing up and flexing down is, is, is painful because if you're planning on 200 containers and you get 45, you got a lot of people standing around and conversely on the other side, it doesn't do anybody good either when you've got, 250 and you're planning for 200. Absolutely. And that was the second point in poor labor management. That is definitely an issue that we see is poor labor management. Well, yeah. And the warehouse that's that and warehousing operations, that has to be one of your largest costs. And, it is. It and, is. And it's interesting when we, we like to tour uh, potential customers facilities and our customers facilities. And it's then sometimes that you'll see, um, that there are improvements that could be made and yeah. that you want to help make these improvements so that your customer can focus on their product and marketing that product. That's a great point. And I thought about this before we got on and I haven't asked it yet because, you know, if I'm a manufacturer and, and I'm doing my own warehousing, my warehousing is a much smaller overall portion of my cost structure and other things like that. Whereas you at Dart there, you know, that's what you do. Do you see that when, cause I was thinking about this, right? I'm a big manufacturer and I, I'm, I'm making stuff and my supply chain or just getting my product out the door and onto trucks. is such a little part of the overall that I do. Do you see that you're a lot more efficient because you have to be in your business to make money and be successful compared to some of the manufacturers where it's not their focus? Absolutely. 110 percent, Damon. <laughs> and with all due respect, I mean, we want to be able to help. We want to utilize yeah. our expertise and our knowledge and really, you know, level up these supply chains where people need that help. Uh, you want to focus on your product, marketing your product, selling your product. 
Mm -hmm. Supply chain. I think that the misconception of supply chain is that it's easier, more simplistic than it really is. And there are more moving parts than people expect. And so they want that control. I've seen a couple of things. I've seen startups to mid-sized businesses, uh, you know, come to me and say, you know, handle all of our fulfillment, all of everything. And they're just not ready for it. I mean, they could handle it out of their garage, just like yeah. Spanx. It's, yeah. it's not necessary. And then I see the startups, mid-sized companies, they're ready for a 3PL provider, but my mom does all the picky and packing. And my yeah. dad does all the labeling, Margo. I, I don't want to put my family out of a job. Yeah. And you don't have to, because what happens at that point when you're scaling is you're bringing in that technology, you're bringing in that management, the labor management. And now your mom and your dad, they're managing the transportation at a higher level. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not just sticking a label on a box. That's I made that sound a lot easier than it is, but it's 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 going to be a higher level view. Yeah. And so they'll still be incorporated in the business. We're not looking to cut heads. In fact, I think that when you look at the supply chain and increasing profitability through that supply chain, you're going to be able to add more people to your business. Yeah. We're not because looking you can, to cut heads. Yes. You can scale your business because you're getting your product to your customers faster and man, it's the yeah, it's going out the door better. And that that helps you to make more business or more sales that will help you to increase the profitability. And you're right. And you can you can upscale or not upscale, but level up some of your people and give them advantage or opportunities that they may not have had. Um that's that's cool because it is it was something I was thinking about because you can then help your customers be better in their operations so you can be more successful helping them. Exactly. If they if they can't get you the stuff like you want or inconsistently and blah 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 blah, there's a million different things that could happen. Then then it's going to cost you more on your end to handle and do what you need to do. Definitely. And that's why you have to manage all these working parts. So you think about the raw materials and then you think about the packaging as well. And so all of that just kind of ties into the end product and getting it to your customer as fast as possible before the competition does. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you really just want to be easy to do business with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Because that, man, it just, it's, it is so much more complex. The supply chain is so much more complex. Uh, it, it just, it is. It's the complexity has gotten crazy with the amount of, you know, that the, you know, you can get, you can be sourcing. I mean, we, we did a project and this is a lot of years ago. We did a project where we were sourcing off of like four continents and that was crazy in those days because it was. But, da it, but, but David, people are not doing that enough now, right? Really? Yeah. Well, I mean, okay. So uh, pre-pandemic, yeah, seventy percent was coming out of China, mm -hmm. and I have some counterparts, good friends in the industry that do freight forwarding, and a couple of them were laid off because everything shut down. But yep. mind you, right before this, people were looking at Vietnam, Taiwan, and they were already starting to look at other places that they could manufacture, and so they had a head start. And you could see that those are the companies that were really successful in this because they differentiated their manufacturing. After this, people are doing that now again. Now, wow. how many manufacturers or where geographically they're placed, definitely want to analyze that, take a look at it to streamline. But I think it's a good idea. You don't always want to put all your eggs in one basket. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good point. Good point. So, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. The... The thing that I think that I've learned today talking to you here is that you really need some good partners to look at this because it's not something you're just going to wake up and know. Finding someone that has experience and knowledge that can help walk you through this in a basic way will help you tremendously. I highly recommend it. I am here as a free resource People can contact me. I can walk them through scenarios. I'd be more than happy to, you know, it, it is really complicated, but it can be broken down into pieces that are understandable so that you can really take that and move your supply chain to the next level. And like I said, for that thousandth time, focus on that product and your customer. Yeah. 
Yeah, do what you're good at and have partners to help you do the other things that you need done that they're good at. Yeah, because I mean, if you're look at think about your manufacturing, I don't know if you look at units per hour, units of measurement. I mean, these are things that we're constantly looking at a daily basis. We look at slot, slotting and optimization, different things that we can do uh, to really uh save money in the supply chain so that you can grow in other ways. Mm -hmm. So I would just suggest getting with a trusted advisor, whoever that may be, even there's some retired people out there and there's some great people that are in the industry currently, but Mm -hmm. um, start those conversations. They'll, they'll be helpful. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Margo, it's, it's been great to talk to you today. Thanks so much for stopping by and, and just your, the Cargo Margo Show, if people hadn't listened to that, you got to listen to it. It's great. Uh, wonderful host. I will put that in there, too. Thank and, you. And then the work that you're doing to help people with their supply chain and you know, just improving the effectiveness and then increasing the profitability in their supply chain is, is awesome because it's something that, that, you know, manufacturers, retailers, and anybody that's moving products that have to go someplace else really need to be looking at. Yeah, I agree. And I'm here. Connect with me. I'd love to help you out and give you some information and some resources. All right. Thank you so so much, Damon. It's awesome. It's awesome to have you on finally. And so on LinkedIn, you are are Margo Cargo Margo Waldy, if people didn't know that. So that's Mm -hmm. you can find her on LinkedIn. Just want to make sure I get that out there. We'll have dart entities and the other stuff in all the show notes here and if anyone needs to you can reach out to margo connect with her on linkedin and if you can't find her for some reason reach out to me and i just want to say thank you for being here it was a pleasure and we'll have to have you back sometime again and we'll figure out something else fun to talk about i love it thank you damon (laughs) you're amazing i appreciate it honored thank you so much you bet Everyone else, thanks so much for being here. We will be back again next week.